How are you doing? I am fine, thank you. Awesome. So we are uh, live now. Okay. I'm going to give another couple of minutes yeah. for the other panelists to join. Hi, Andrew. Yeah, yeah. Give us give us a couple of minutes, Andrew. Let's. I think uh, a, a bunch of people are running late. How how are you doing, Mikhail? There. Uh, quite well, thank you. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So Ira and I were just chatting before this. Okay. So so let's uh, kick start this. We are live. Uh, so hello and welcome to the Horaces Global Meeting 2021. Uh, the the topic for our panel today is how do we reinvigorate. Uh, the fifth uh, industrial revolution. Uh, as you know, there is no kind of standards body that sets the definition for what is the fifth industrial revolution. What does that really mean when you say like this is the fifth industrial revolution? Uh, and uh, when I think about it, you know, uh, humans have been uh, figuring out really interesting ways. How do we become more productive and efficient for a really, really long time? So I'm going to borrow a definition uh, from uh, one of the events at the World Economic Forum that happened in 2019. So Mark Benioff, who's the founder and CEO of Salesforce, at an event uh, at the World Economic Forum in 2019, made a very, very interesting statement. And that uh, that was uh, uh, th that had a, a, a interesting ripple effect. Right. So the statement is, quote, uh, the fifth industrial revolution will be about saving the planet and restoring trust and equality. How do we use this amazing new tech to undo the damage we have caused to our air, oceans and forests? Let's innovate for our planet, not just ways to get off of it, unquote. So that's that's kind of an interesting thing. If you always think about uh, technology, technology brings uh, more automation. Uh, it uh, it really figures out a way. How do we uh, kind of become more efficient to become more productive? The capital that you're putting in uh, to back some technology, how does that capital give you kind of better returns? Right. But uh, can we really uh, change gears and uh, become uh, kind of have a balance here? between like, you know, that the, uh, you, you have to have uh, uh, a good uh, kind of incentive model going on. But can we also be collective? Right. And and that's the definition will set uh, the tone for this panel and, and this discussion. So my name is Jitesh Shetty. I'm going to chair the panel. So uh, I uh, co-founded a company called Quick Labs uh, in 2012. In 2016, that company was acquired by Google. It's an education tech company. After that, I started Infinity Chains, which is a, a sustainable supply chain tech company. Uh, what we do there is uh, we enable uh, all the way from the uh, farmer to the uh, end brand in the uh, cotton world uh, to become more transparent and, and really uh, kind of showcase their sustainability efforts. Right. And we make it like really, really uh, easy as almost like a click of a button. So that's that's kind of my background. Uh, so to give some more uh, color to this, right? Uh, if you think about our world and the world around us, what we are seeing is uh, the impact of technology uh, and how it drives exponentials all around us. If you think about right, uh, deep tech products, uh, they start with a very small user base. They start with very small capital. And then these small kind of uh, actions and small capital, small team, they start compounding. And over a period of time, uh, you see this really doubling that happens and it leapfrogs uh, the company or the initiative from almost unknown. You have never heard of the company. 
uh, to it becomes like mainstream and it becomes like uh, almost like household name right think about almost any vertical automobile logistics uh, how you buy stuff today in uh, e-commerce uh, education tech right how folks are learning right uh, there is this very interesting exponential that happens i want to give one example uh, in terms of data right so i live in the bay area i live in here in the palo alto area and uh, you know uh, we order a lot of food uh, from uh, this very interesting uh, uh, product called doordash uh, but when you look at like food delivery platforms they are very global today right in india there's a company called swiggy here uh, there's a company called doordash what's interesting about food delivery platforms that in 2018 there were less than 5 million humans uh, using food delivery platforms to deliver food you fast forward that to 2020 uh, in 2020 as the pandemic hit there were 1.2 billion humans who ordered at least once food using food delivery platforms so that's a massive exponential so technology platforms technology products technologies have this incredible uh, reach an incredible native ability uh, to to have an exponential impact right uh, so the question is uh, the same dynamic is has been happening to the world around us the planet uh, uh, our I, our kind of social and environmental uh, uh, reach overall right in in a very negative way for example if you think about pollution air pollution what has been happening right it's it's an exponential but it's a negative exponential what's been happening with uh, things like fair pay what's been happening with uh, the supply chain for the textile world 80% of the supply chain for the textile world sits in uh, asia and there's a lot of data which shows uh, that there is not enough fair pay there's massive pollution happening with water the same is happening in a negative way to the planet right over a long period of time these negative actions have been compounding so the question is can technology and this fifth uh, kind of industrial revolution can these technologies help uh, have a transformative uh, if impact and create transformative products or platforms that can change the equation here right and change the equation i want to give an example of a few things right uh food security water sustainability supply chain sustainability fair pay uh you know can 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 we have that impact and that's kind of the context for uh for this uh, panel you know can we can we have uh, uh can we create products and platforms uh from these uh five ir technologies uh that enable creation of this value which is not just multiplication of capital but it is being kind of more fair and it's being more equal it's being more collective that's the context right so let me uh start off by giving a quick introduction of the panel we are still waiting for three more people to join okay uh, but uh, let yeah let me start off with mikhail travish right mikhail uh, yeah. is uh, the founder and ceo of omnigrade Uh, Omnigrade is a unique uh, crowd sourcing platform for companies and organizations uh, with ambitious noble goals allowing them to form an international group of supporters in his past life mikhail was one of the prominent figures of international receivable finance industry as you all know that is getting completely rethought redone and uh, reinvented uh with an incredible experience uh, and he was ceo of nfc in russia then going back to ira kainer uh, ira is uh, uh, based out of the philippines his founder and chairman of nautical power energy uh he's also co-founder and ceo of diological uh, ira is super super uh, vested and believes in how technology can have an impact on the business side right technology is not just enough for the sake of technology but how it can solve some of the real world uh, problems and uh, he's making some incredible uh, uh, innovation around the trading side when it comes to uh, energy right one of the big things that happens in energy is if you think about like the derivatives and the energy market there's a lot of kind of trading 
uh, that happens and that underlying technology uh, he spent a lot of time thinking through that so so that's the uh, 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 that's the panel we have so far so uh, the first question i wanted to uh, put it to you mikhail is as the ceo of omnigrade and with your past uh, experience uh, in finance uh what do you think uh, is happening from a next generation tech standpoint when it comes to uh, uh uh funding and the way folks are trying to raise capital right because uh, the uh uh kind, kind of the very orthodox thinking is that people who are investing money they really want to get a better return for their capital that's it they want to go back home right but if you think about this new world for a moment if you wear this hat where you we want to have a better collective impact it's not just about a better return for the capital but there are other metrics there are other okrs do you see fundamental technologies like crypto blockchain that are enabling raising funds uh, with not just a better return for the capital but just doing better for the planet ah uh, well um uh my first point is that most likely a lot of companies need not only more money but ideas and more solutions so it's not uh enough to raise money in order to move forward it's also important to uh find some new unique solutions for the development of companies and for the development of mankind for more sustainable development of mankind and more sustainable development of the companies and uh some technologies will help uh to save money so maybe for some new big projects you will need less money than you need now but uh, of course it will be new financial technologies and that's why i think that uh fintech industry is so booming and i think that in the future it will be very new industries so uh financial industry will uh, become fintech industry construction industry will become build tech industry educational industry will become ed tech industry so it may it means that in all industries uh, we will have completely new technologies not only let's say technical technologies but sometimes social technologies so uh we are at the point where uh, uh, new technologies are coming instead of old technologies in different sectors in transportation and financial sector in a in agricultural sector it will be agri tech companies uh, and now there uh, some agricultural uh, agri tech companies already so it will be very new technologies including of course financial technologies but i can't say that financial technologies will play more important role than educational technologies for instance okay okay thank you thank you mikhail so so just to follow up on that right uh, it's th- there's a lot of uh, this thing happening where software is eating the world uh, to quote like mark anderson right uh, but uh, is there a more kind of fundamental shift happening around uh, the incentive model around it right like in fintech uh, is are you seeing things like you know uh, funding uh, uh, a bunch of initiatives where you just don't want a better return but you want uh, just just uh, 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 just more kind of uh, a better collective problem solving are you seeing any of that well i i think that both goals uh, can be achieved uh, uh, simultaneously i mean you can get a better return but you can get better impact especially on the long term because if you let's say violate uh some ecological problems if you ignore our ecological problems on long term uh you will know to get a good return on your investment so i i don't think that we have the choice between uh substantial development and profitable development so both is possible in in the same basket and uh, i think that we can do two things together Okay okay so I have one important point I'd like to add when we speak 
about financial uh, industry, but not only about financial industry. I think that uh, the role of risk management in, in any industry is now increasing. So risk management is now not only the problem of risk managers, is the problem of the founders of the companies, of the CEOs of the companies. And if you, and they're not only financial risks, it's also ecological risks, uh, um, operational risks, technological risks, and so on. So if you are able to manage your risks, and by the way, you also need new technologies for risk management. And I have the idea that crowdsourcing also can play a role in, not in risk management. So where you can find some hidden risks. For instance, the pandemic is one of the hidden risks in the in the near past. Uh, so if you can uh, use new technologies for management, you will be able to uh, make more profitable business and more sustainable business. Okay. Okay. Awesome. That's uh, that, that's a really interesting uh, that that's a really interesting perspective. So Ira, going back to you, right? When we think about energy in general, I'm a layman to energy. I come from a very kind of consumer education tech uh, background. Uh, but uh, I always think, right, energy was uh, the poster child of sustainability, the poster child of let's do good uh, for like solar, wind, right? Uh, so what do you think is kind of the next uh, uh, kind of the next frontier in terms of sustainability and more kind of collective development with energy, right? Yeah. So, yeah, to um, address your question, um, I... I'd like to think of it as three concentric circles. So um, the larger picture is, would basically consist of uh, climate change. So that, that, that's like one major issue that we're all concerned about these days, right? And then um, the second circle within, within that larger circle would be energy policy. So how do we reshape energy policy in order to create impact on the... Um, on, on, on climate change and, and reduce emissions, particulates, um, you know, hydrocarbons and things of that nature. And then um, within within the those three concentric circles, right in the middle, I think would be um, developing financial solutions like tokenization in order to raise capital for, for, for private companies so that they too can also implement uh, more sustainable energy projects like solar solar uh, solar uh, power plants wind power plants, geothermal, um, and even LNG, which is uh, not really a, um, a form of renewable energy, but it is a form of clean energy. And in that sense, it's already the, the price per kilowatt hour for LNG-based power plants have almost come down to the price of coal. So you can produce power at the same, almost at the same price that you can produce power using a coal power plant. So given that, um, the technologies are available to us, the resources are abundant, there's um, you know, infinite amount of sunlight at, at, this, at this particular point. Of course, that's, that's a bit of an exaggeration and a, and a bit of a stretch, but um, it's abundant, it's free. And then when you also look at the real estate, I mean, like, look at all the unused uh, space on all the rooftops in, in uh, you know, the collective you know, in, in, in all of the collective cities that we have, all of these rooftops are potential areas where we could lay down solar panels and have grid tied systems. And when you have a grid tied system, you can have less reliance on the grid. And so in third world countries where there's heavy reliance on coal, on on diesel and other types of, um, you know, uh, um, emission um, creating, you know, power plants, you know, all of these things can be mitigated by um, perhaps using um, new technologies like, you know, I mean, solar panels have, have come like a long way now. I mean, from 45 percent efficiency. Now we're seeing, you know, about 65 to about 70 percent efficiency, you, you know, using monocrystalline um, solar panels. They're now smart batteries that can basically, um, you know, uh, charge themselves whenever, uh, you know, power is, is, is cheap and power is like, Expensive, it start releasing, um, you know, power from 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 these batteries. So there are so many technologies that are available to us, and, and other emission producing um, power plants and and uh, even electric vehicles, um, transportation. Um, a lot of these things can be mitigated with the use of sustainable forms of energy. Okay. Okay. 
Thank you. So I want to challenge Mikhail a little bit, right? So, uh, you know, uh, let's take an example of uh, uh, a sustainable uh, value chain, a sustainable supply chain like fashion and textile, right? And if I'm a brand sitting in the U.S. Uh, and, you know, I'm uh, I'm like catering to my consumers here in the U.S., at the end of the day, my OKRs, my goals, what I want to do is work with suppliers who can give me uh, uh, the best cost. I want to get this really good kind of uh, price arbitrage going mm-hmm. and then, uh, you know, really uh, cater to my kind of consumers and give them the best experience, either digital, physical or kind of blended experience. Right. So at that point, right, I am driving the demand. What is the incentive for me as a brand, as, as H&M, Lululemon, any brand, think about any brand in the Western world. What is my incentive to make sure that on the supply side, uh, there is uh, there is the kind of uh, fair equity, there is fair pay. There is, you know, my suppliers are doing the right thing. They are not underpaying. Uh, they are not using child labor. Uh, they are not polluting uh, uh, their kind of world. Um uh well um uh, I, I, I don't have a, a definite answer to a question because I think it's quite complicated we can't control uh, every company in the world but I fo- think that what we can do we can uh increase the value of transparency so yeah. if you can and uh, uh the lack of transparency by the way is one of the um uh, serious issues for our business because what we are trying to do we are trying to uh, invite crowds to invite wide audience find the solution of the business issues of different companies of the most complicated business solutions of different companies and these companies sometimes are afraid to uh, open the issues to the white audience so uh, uh, our uh, aim is to show that if you open your issues, if you uh, open the details of your development, your problems, your challenges, you will win. You will not lose. And uh, uh, we need to change the investment behavior. So uh, companies with problems, but who are transparent, who are honest about their problems, should receive more money on, for instance, more money or preferred conditions from their suppliers then uh, companies who are not transparent, who are not honest. Uh, so it, I think, but I am afraid it's quite a long way. And uh, we are living in the era of the pandemic of COVID-19. One, maybe one of the reasons of this pandemic is that the situation uh, about this uh, disease, about COVID, wasn't transparent enough in January 2020, in February 2020. If we have uh, a full information about this virus, about the, all threats, most likely we'll not see uh, a lot of deaths, or a lot of um, uh, other problems which we can see now. So it's maybe one of the most serious and the greatest argument in favor of greater transparency. So I don't know how to solve this issue, but I think that we need to, to go in this direction. Yeah, that's a that's a great point, Mikhail. Right, transparency in general, not just in supply chains, but also kind of surfacing that up all the way in uh, with your kind of uh, with your kind of financial posture, uh, with how your operations are working, uh, is is always kind of a good thing, and it's the right direction to go under. Right, and I, I really like uh, your kind of example of the of the pandemic. I think the world would have saved uh, so much, so much. Uh, 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 just, just, uh, capital cost and also human life, right? With what yeah. happened, uh, if, uh, if a lot of us were more transparent. So I are going back to the, to the energy world, right? Uh, and, and taking kind of the same example, uh, do you see, uh, like, uh, uh, uh increased transparency happening in the energy kind of supply chain, uh, when it comes to, uh, folks trying to, uh, either do, uh, uh, trading in the financial uh, world or uh, who are trying to build out some of these operations, right, in the solar or wind uh, 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 world, right? Uh, is, there, is there more transparency? Do you see that happening? 
Absolutely. Uh, so there's a, a new product that's been rolled out by the Securities and Exchange Commission here in the Philippines uh, called Renewable Energy Contracts. And so what these renewable energy contracts are um, are intended for are so that an off-taker of power can basically select uh, the purchase um, power from a renewable energy plant. And so these renewable energy contracts are now being traded on online platforms. And online platforms are usually synonymous with transparency, mainly because you know, you're coursing it through a platform, it's capturing the data, and you're able to slice and dice that, that data in any way, shape, or form that you'd like to produce uh, you know, information in different ways. Um, and so uh, the short answer to your question is um, yes, absolutely. And um, I think that going forward, that, that the level of transparency in energy trading, I think, will only get better with the passage okay. of time. Okay, thank you. So, uh, Mikhail, for you, right, the, uh, the uh, second question, uh, what we are seeing with the pandemic is, is, is a massive black swan event, which has caught like humanity super off guard, right? Like almost uh, no one was prepared for this kind of both like a complete lockdown and stop of economic activity and then uh, kind of reacting to this in terms of uh, healthcare infrastructure how do you really now make sure uh, that uh, uh, that this huge uh, set of humans become more productive right so what do you think is the impact this has happened on kind of new innovation right innovation and new technology build out do you feel it has either uh, has it slowed down or in a weird way it has really been a forcing function for example what you see with fang stock that's happening in the us right all the big technology companies, they've done really well because as humans are more at home, they're either uh, they're, they're using more and more of these technologies, right? They're ordering more online. Uh, they are uh, they're using more uh, education tech products. They're, they're, uh, digitization has been like it's been a forcing function for digitization. What's your view on this? Is, has it been a negative or a positive? Uh, well, I, I think that it depends on each particular country, uh, company. So even if uh, you are in the industry which is suffering a lot from the pandemic, you can think about new opportunities for your company. Well, just for instance, if you are in a tourist uh, business, uh, uh, international tourism is suffering. But for instance, you can launch virtual tourism. And nowadays, you can find quite a lot of new virtual uh, um, uh, touristic projects. So if you're in um, airline business, um, of course, you are suffering from the pandemic. But a lot of airlines are now started to, to open the chains of restaurants. Maybe it's not uh, when you can uh, uh, try the board meal. So it may be not the question of... Uh, uh, um, high level technologies, virtual tourism is more close to uh, with, uh, high level technologies, but in each industry you can find new opportunities and of course new, tra new threats and new opportunities. But you need uh, to have some time to think about it. And in, in any industry there are new opportunities and opportunities to implement new technologies. So there are no uh, industry, no company, no organization, no sector which is uh, can can find an opportunity to develop some new uh, ideas, new solutions uh, because of the pandemic. The only issue that you can have not a lot of time for this. So if you have lack of liquidity, lack of money, even if you have new brilliant ideas, you are not ready to implement them because you have no financing. But you can find new ideas and new solutions in every industry. I am completely sure. Okay. Okay. You just Thank need you. Time and body. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Mikhail. So I have the same thing, right? In in energy power uh, uh, around like innovation and uh, kind of uh, new technologies, are you seeing the pandemic as a negative, or are you seeing like it is it is uh, really be been a forcing function to rethink, uh, kind of be more innovative, right? Yes. Um 
you know, with within the context of technology and its development and acceleration, I definitely think that the pandemic has compressed the amount of time with which, uh, you know, new technologies have developed. And mainly because, you know, we, in a way, have been forced from the physical realm into the digital digital realm. So uh, case in point, you know, I mean, like, it, had the pandemic not happened, people would have probably continued to go to restaurants and, uh, you know, dine in. Um, they would have continued to have gone to malls and, and, and continued to shop there. But um, now you've seen, now, now we're seeing, you know, businesses, uh, you know, tech, um, technology businesses that are basically thriving and, and doing extremely well, um, you know, just as you had pointed out in, in, in the very beginning, you know, the number of uh, people that have ordered, like, you know, from an order from an online platform prior to the pandemic versus like after the pandemic. So it definitely accelerated the speed at which technology has become, has, has developed and integrated into our daily lives. So um, from that point of view, I think the pand- that, that's a silver lining from the, uh, from, from, from the pandemic. Okay, awesome. Thank you, Ira. So, so Mikhail, from a Dio standpoint, right, I know you have this extensive background in Asia. How are you seeing uh, some of the adoption of new technologies? How, are, how is it different uh, in that part of the world, right, in, in Russia and in, in Southeast Asia, as compared to what you see happening in the, in, the, uh, in, in the Americas and then in Europe, right, Western Europe? How do you see that? What's what's different, and and has that any of that changed in the pandemic? Uh, well, I don't think that uh, this is a huge difference between Asia, Europe, and Americas. Uh, I think that uh, people are more or less the same, and uh, the challenges are the same. So when the pandemic started, it started in China, and we 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 fought for a couple of weeks. That is purely Chinese issue, but after that, it. Uh, became an Italian issue, and today is global issue. So uh, all issues are global and all solutions are global. And we can see that new technologies can uh, appear in very small countries. Uh, just for instance, if you know the, the Skype, uh, now it's not so popular because of Zoom and uh, other telecommunication platform, but uh, Skype uh, introduced many years ago a very revolutionary solution to the market. And Skype uh, uh, is a company from small company uh, from small country called Estonia. They have only 1.5 million people population. So I, I, tomorrow, I can imagine that you can find uh, new technologies and new solutions somewhere in Cambodia or somewhere else. Uh, maybe small countries. I, I, I would like to say not only about difference between Asia and um, Europe and Americas, but also between small countries and big countries. Because today, a lot of technologies are coming from relatively big countries, so India, uh, the US, uh, China. But tomorrow, I think that small countries, small uh, uh, communities will have more opportunity uh, to make their voice uh, heard from the uh, uh, global influences and uh, um, from um, uh, the population of the world. So I, I think that uh, even if you are living in a very small country, uh, somewhere far from uh, London or California or uh, Tokyo, you can have a chance to introduce something completely new. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Mikhail. So, uh, Ira, going back to the uh, uh, to Mark uh, Benioff's kind of quote, right, like where, uh, you know, uh, the, the kind of the next generation technologies should not just give a better better return to the capital, but they should just do overall better to the planet, right? And when I think of the Philippines, one of the big things I think of is like the massive bottling plants that are there, the recycling efforts that happen there. So as someone living there, do you really see uh, initiatives happening around recycling, sustainability, <laughs> And uh, do you see technology kind of accelerating uh, some of that in in that part of the world? Do you see those initiatives being accelerated with technology? A lot of those policies are uh, currently being um, formed and are trickling down from you know the larger uh, you know the larger governments. Uh, you know, I mean, the, 
I'll, I'll, case in point, like, you know, the World Bank and the IMF have basically um, started giving uh, stimulus um, to encourage, you know, um, sustainability projects. So things of that nature that you mentioned, uh, recycling, um, sustainable projects like, you know, renewable energy projects and so forth. And so a lot of these uh, stimulus packages that have that have come from, you know, these um, these world banks have now begun trickling down to the central banks of various various countries. And as a result, that has started to form public policy at, you know, the national, regional, provincial, and at the city levels. And so um, to answer your question, yes, um, uh, the, the legislators are now beginning to form and craft policy to foster those types of initiatives that you had just mentioned. Re- recycling, sustainability, um, resiliency, uh, and of course, you know, um, looking at the overall picture for the well-being of humankind as a whole. Okay, awesome, awesome, Maya. Thank you. So, uh, uh, just to just to contrast a little bit, right? In my uh, kind of current startup, Infini Chains, we have a supply chain uh, platform called Credible, and that platform is used by around a million farmers, co-ops, and operators who produce organic stuff, mostly in Asia. And then also kind of uh, on the higher end in the supply chain, it's used by suppliers and brands. One of the uh, uh, the key value props of the platform is that it enables uh, all of these stakeholders to be more kind of transparent, uh, really uh, uh, be upfront with their uh, uh, both social and environmental practices. Right. And then the benefit on the other end is for uh, either brands and consumers they really know now what they are buying, right? The end product that they are buying. Uh, uh, we make it very, very easy for them to access that data with almost like a click of a button, like any modern consumer product, software product that you've used. The challenge that we see, though, is in the supply chain. Uh, you know, as you go to the leaf nodes, if you think of the supply chain as a graph, as you go to the leaf nodes, uh, we uh, see it more and more difficult how to incentivize uh, some of the leaf nodes to really be more transparent, right? And uh, take that operational overhead hit. Uh, and we we have to constantly think of innovative ways uh, to uh, either kind of gamify or, or figure out ways how to give them uh, some uh, uh, economic kind of incentive to really give that data back, right? And I feel the same is happening not just in supply chains, but even in all across the board in that ESG spectrum, right? Environmental, social governance, right? How do you really uh, become better in all of those three pillars, right? So, uh, you know, I know Andrew has a question here. So I'm going to hand over the mic to Andrew. Uh, Andrew, I think you have the mic now. Hello, everyone. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I was I was kind of curious, how do you see applications like machine learning fitting into the idea of the industrial revolution, the fifth industrial revolution? And like, how is it distinct from the fourth industrial revolution? Like, like something I, I struggle with, with the phrasing of it is, we know of like the first industrial revolution, then everything was different. Um, but it seems a little more vague now, particularly with the pandemic. Uh, so I was just curious about what are your thoughts on like these other things like the nanotech and the AI that are supposed to fundamentally change life and will they in a similar fashion to the initial industrial revolution? Yeah, I, I can I can give you my uh, my kind of quick uh, uh, ten cents on it, right? And then I let Mikhail and uh, uh, Ira go for it. So I think AI and machine learning they are going to be like uh, almost natively built into any software offering almost like you know as you uh, back in the day said i'm going to run this piece of software on this os on this hardware uh, it is going to be a de facto expectation that there are a set of machine learning and ai models uh, that will be available similar to what google did with google photos for example right there is this expectation with the consumer uh, that my photos are going to be run by uh, through a bunch of AI and ML models. Uh, and uh, there's a bunch of automation that these models will do for me. As we move forward, uh, you know, most enterprise software and consumer software will by default have this. 
you know, and the expectation will be set that if you're r- running, giving me any consumer or enterprise software, it has a basic level of machine learning and AI models built in, right? Uh, almost anything, education tech, uh, if I'm giving you a bunch of documents or images, some of the automation is happening through a neural net and uh, and AI ML based kind of modeling, right? And it's not a set of humans going and uh, doing some of that repetitive automation work. Uh, Mikhail, do you want to go? Uh, do you want to answer that? Uh, well, I, I, I think that uh, artificial intelligence uh, will be one of the main driving force in fourth industrial revolution and in fifth industrial revolution. Uh, the difference, in my opinion, is uh, uh, that it will be different. AIs. So in fourth industrial revolution, it will be pure uh, uh, artificial intelligence. In my opinion, uh, after that, it will be a kind of combination between um, artificial intelligence and cloud intelligence. So it will be more a uh, higher level of humanitarization of artificial intelligence, if it is possible to say so, because uh, AI. Uh, is uh, very good in terms of intelligence, in terms of finding of analysis, in finding uh, the solutions of the most complex and complicated uh, problems. But uh, uh, the, the, the disadvantage is that um, uh, you need not only deep analysis, but also some imagination and creativity. And without human participation, you can't uh, find this imagination and creativity. So it will be maybe social technologies which uh, will give you the opportunity to combine cloud intelligence and um, artificial intelligence. And uh, th- this is my, my forecast, if possible to say so. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Mikhail. Uh, Ira, do you, do you have any thoughts on that? Is AI ML going to become kind of uh, mainstream in this kind of next generation technologies? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, Andrew, thank you. Thank you for that question. And um, so to answer the first part, uh, you know, with the sheer volume of data that's flowing through, you know, the various, um, you know, cloud-based servers that, that we have these days, it's an inevitability that machine learning and AI will basically uh, usher into a new era of, you know, um, of the way that humans and technology inter- interact. Now, I think that the more important question um, that, that's being begged is, um, you know, whether or not, or what is the extent to which AI and machine learning are going to become complementary to human beings as opposed to becoming or having, you know, overlapping goals. So I think that's the, that's, that's, that's the first um, issue that needs to be, um, you know, uh, that, that remains to, to be answered uh, going forward. Um, the second thing that I'd like to address is your, uh, you also touched on the difference between fourth and the fifth industrial revolution. So the fourth industrial revolution was mainly, in my own humble opinion, characterized by the development of new technologies like artificial intelligence, uh, machine learning, as you had earlier mentioned, uh, you know, other things like um, blockchain, tokenization, Internet of Things data science, um, you name it. I mean, the, the, there's there's just a whole host of different technologies that were created during the fourth industrial revolution. The fifth industrial revolution, on the other hand, I think it would be characterized as all of these technologies being enabled and basically being used to create solutions to address new problems that are emerging or um, age-old problems that, um, that we have never needed to address like in the ways that you know that and with the amount of urgency that we are now faced with awesome thank you thank you Ira. i think we are uh, at time i don't know mikhail uh, you have any kind of closing statements on uh, this just kind of summarizing and in a nutshell what do you think uh, you know is the defining thing when it comes to the fifth industrial revolution Uh, well, uh, I think that we still have time to, to design this industrial revolution according to our own opinion. So it will not start uh, just tomorrow, fortunately. 
so it depends on us, on our creativity, on our proposals, on uh, new technologies which are not exist yet, but uh, will appear tomorrow thanks to our creativity. So we, we still have yeah. time to make uh, this revolution uh, more useful for, for, for mankind. Awesome. I Aya, do you have any closing statements? Um, yeah, I, uh, I think that the industrial revolution will be characterized mainly by the um, harvesting of much more data, uh, you know,